Well, on behalf of everyone, I want to thank Ken for leading our prayers for others today. Well, let's come back to our study of 1 Thessalonians 4, 1 to 12. And when I looked at this passage and I read verses 3 to 8, I had to admit that I wondered how this passage or the subject dealt with in these verses, that of sex, would relate to many of the people tuned in today and sharing in this act of worship. But the reality is that this is one of the three biggest things that seems to motivate people most in the world today, or indeed in any age, sex, money and power. And there, I suppose there is a stage in life, there is an age in life in which the first of these sex is very important to us. And let's be honest, in the history of religion, it has been used as much as any ideology or politics as a means of pursuing all three. In fact, the writer John Stott throws into the mix this because he makes a suggestion that the rest of this um, letter, this first letter of Paul to the Thessalonians, deals with sex, work and death, the three major themes of the remainder of the letter. And he says this, can, these continue to be the three major human preoccupations. And that, he suggests, is what makes it relevant to us today. Now, as you'd expect, there is a background to this and to what Paul writes, because he's writing into the situation of a Greek city in the ancient world. And that, those circumstances make a bridge from that day to this day and makes it relevant to our day. Now, a lot has been written uh, about the ancient world and the condition of the ancient world, the sensual nature of relationships or the immorality of the ancient world and of cities in the ancient world in particular. And we need to bear in mind here that Paul is writing this letter from Corinth to Thessalonica, both major cities, but cities also where sex was practiced as part of of religion. Would you call it even worship? Now, in general then the point is true. This is an age in which everything went, at least as far as men were concerned, everything was on the table. Not only were the opportunities plentiful, but the expectation was strong. The pressure to comply was powerful, was a powerful factor in the lives of those who would read this letter. Now, that was the culture in which this church existed. That was the background against which the people in the church were called to love other believers. Now, one writer makes a point here that Paul's speech is an eloquent commentary on the lax standard of sexual morality, so characteristic of the world of his day. And there's nothing that we've discovered that would contradict that. You don't have to push it too far though, until you see the similarities with our day, with the 21st century, and the trends that are developing in our world today. Immorality and illicit sexual activity, at least as far as the Bible is concerned, has always been present in the world. It's always been part of our society, but until recently it was hidden. It was something that was done behind closed doors. It was something that people didn't talk about. Today though, the brakes are off uh, and people don't seem to be too fussed about who knows their business as far as this is concerned, nor are they concerned about the trail of broken relationships uh, and damaged lives that follow as a consequence sometimes of these things. And now these things are considered mundane. We, they don't even cause us to bat an eyelid. I haven't seen the programme, you'll be glad to know, um, but I have seen the trailers of the new BBC show called Harlots. Now, my mind goes back a few years and uh, Sunday Half Hour, which was a, a radio show on BBC Radio 2 on a Sunday evening, was ditched at least, well, maybe not ditched, but it was moved to 6am 
on a Sunday morning when most people are still in bed sleeping. And harlots is in. So it's out. Harlots are in. Now, do I want my license fee spent on making programs like that as a, as a believer? Do I want my license fee spent on making programs like harlots? No. But is anybody listening? Does anyone care? No. Now, that may seem prudish. It may seem out of place in this day, but it gives us, nonetheless, a clue as to how things are heading generally. Now, I hope that's not a mindless rant. I hope it's not seen as a mindless rant. Um, certainly, it's not intended to be that. But the point is that our society, the society of our day, expects us to conform expects us as believers to go along with all of this and not to rock the boat, not to not to be seen to be out of step, to kind of bless the activity of others as much as the society did in Paul's day. He, however, points to a higher purpose and a higher authority and we must, on the one hand, recognise that and then, on the other hand, obey that authority. Now where does that, what is that authority? Well the authority is the Lord himself. Now God's purpose is, and it's stated here, God's purpose is that we should be sanctified, that we should be separated more and more from what is wrong in the world and the lifestyle that is wrong in the world uh, and is demonstrated sometimes in our lives and we should be set apart more and more for his glory. And part of that is living more and more in conformity with him rather than in conformity with our desires or the pressures of the world around us. Now that said there's a general point I think here to be made as well. That anything or anyone that we give a greater place to or a greater devotion to than our Lord Jesus Christ is out of place. And to do that is sinful. The authority behind that is not man's authority, but according to verse 8, it is God who has put his spirit in us and therefore who has given us power to conform not to the world, but to his call on our lives. So none of us should say, oh, oh, we can't do this, we can't live like this. God has given us power to do that by his Holy Spirit. And that conformity to Christ grows properly out of our love for him. It grows properly in that way. And hopefully it's not simply out of fear because he is the righteous judge or purely out of a sense of obligation but purely and wholly from a sense of love. Well, that kind of love is expressed, I think, in our next song, which I hope you will listen to and which I hope you will use to worship just as you do. Let me warn you, it's quite a long song, um, but it's, uh, these are old words, but words that are so powerful. So let's listen to them together and then I'll see you in a moment or two as we conclude our thoughts. <laughs> 